So welcome again to the first Canadian Freedom Summit. Thank you again, Laurie. So I had a little brief introduction planned for the panel, but I think since we're running a little short on time, I want you to hear less from me, more from the panel. So real quick, let me just introduce them. So Alex Van Ham is an independent journalist and founder of Freebird Media, a media platform dedicated to preserving and promoting free speech. He's a fierce individualist and has been rig rigorously documenting the current political climate on university campuses. And as you can see, he's uh, promoting his media right there. Freebird Free Media, Media just give it a point. It Next we have Amanda Ellen Gibbs. She's a student at McMaster University studying physics who spends her time speaking out against campus censorship, third wave feminism, and left wing discourse pertaining to Islam. Of the panel, she's the only one to have brought personal muscle over here, so here's her bodyguard. And she is the founder of Liberal Not Lefty, a blog recently featured in an interview with Epoch Times that focuses on classical liberalism, secularism, civil liberties, and Canadian censorship. <laughs> Finally, we have Josephine Matias, a fourth-year political science student from the University of Toronto. She is the personality behind the popular YouTube channel, My Name is Josephine, where she discusses issues pertaining to race, gender, and political correctness. She has been featured in the Toronto Sun, Rebel Media, The Gavin McGuinness Show, and a number of political YouTube channels. So one more round of applause for our panelists. And so now I'm going to rush into the questions, all right? So let's start with Amanda. So in your opinion, what is the primary factor behind the observed increase of censorship occurring on Canadian campuses today? Well, usually I'm quite averse to trying to minimize one complex problem to a sole factor intent or driving motive, but I do think there is one overarching nefarious agenda um, to the free speech and censorship issue, and I think that is the profitability of victimization. Um, and in that I mean when someone or some institution or political party tells you that you are a victim, and not only that you are a victim, but that they are A, the solution to solving the grievances that make you a victim, which are also constructed by them. B, that there is a group, and this is where in-groups, out-groups come into play, who are at fault for those grievances which they've constructed. And I don't think it's any surprise that that out-group is usually comprised of the demographic of their political opposition. And C, when they base the identity of the victimhood on something like gender, race, religion, and try and conflate that with political belief. This makes it a lot easier to do things like demonize the straight white male or dismiss um, minorities with you know, dissenting views in part. That's why Milo became so big. Um, and, and D, the biggest one, to do that using emotions and labels and identity and make their own game in doing so and part of their game being not being open to debate or pragmatism or logic it's quite convenient so that they don't ever have to debate anyone when they do that and they create that victimhood status they also make them dependent on them and make mm -hmm. people those victims dependent on their institution so knowing that it becomes very easy to see why universities are incentivizing censorship because it gets money, why the media is all for that, is, you know, social media and uh, the internet has become the vehicle for media and millennials are huge consumers of that. And when ad revenue is king, they're going to click on what, you know, the emotional buzzwords that fill headlines. It becomes very easy to see how this victimhood complex is incredibly profitable for all people involved. And when the, the current political party benefits from it, they're not going to hold the universities accountable and they're not going to hold media accountable. So that's my two cents. All right, thank you. So 
Jackson and uh, Josephine, um, since you're a commentator on race and gender, do you think the permanence of victimhood or in-group, out-group type of tribalism has an influence? Or would you say there's another, let's say, uh, insidious factor that's causing censorship to be so prominent on campuses today? On Canadian campuses, I think I would have to say it's probably the student union. That's probably one of the biggest ones. Um, so they claim to represent the entire student body and they're the first point of contact when the administration needs to gauge student opinion. Um, and the crazy thing about it is the, the majority of the students that are in the student union are social justice warriors. So at York University, you have the BLM. At Ryerson, you have the feminists. At University of Toronto here, we have Antifa. And it's kind of just this collective group of people that are trying to silence other students, um, or trying to censor other students, rather. And um, I don't know. I just feel like... Sorry, I just lost my train of thought. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's just those group of people that are trying to silence, try to censor. And they frame their ideas or they frame their agenda as, we're fighting against racism, so therefore we have to shut down this event. We're fighting against um, sexism, so we don't want that speaker to come to, you know, speak out of school. And because they frame it that way, it's easier for the administration to say, okay, yeah, sure. I mean, can you imagine the president of U of T says, we don't agree with your fight against racism? It will be on the Toronto Sun or the Toronto News the next day. Um, so because they frame it that way, it's easier for them to censor other students, it's easier for them to shut down events, which is interesting because only about 5% of students voted for the current uh, student union president here at U of T. So that means 95%, of course, can obviously, hopefully, change the vote and vote in better people. We just have to drain the swamp. We just have to get <laughs> rid of all these... Seriously, no, seriously, we do. Um, but yeah, if I, if I were to pick a single group, it would be the student union. They have the most amount of power. They're saying they're speaking for us. Their voice is our voice. So we need to start voting people in that do, do represent the majority of students. So yeah, if I had to take that. Okay. So then Alex, we have the victimhood complex. We have the presence of student unions. Um, what's your take? Um, I think They've both uh, hit on very valid points, and I think uh, it's a very complex issue. Um, one of the things about identity politics, um, I, you know, I, I personally am an individualist. I hate identity politics. I find that uh, on university campuses, there's a, a strong, um, you know, they push the, the cultural Marxist stuff pretty heavy. But I think, uh, ironically, race does come into it on some level, and I think white people, uh, you know, white people aren't all the same, but upper class white people tend to be driving a lot of this chaos too. Uh, I think guilt alleviation uh, is a factor here because most of the events I've been at, it's been um, an SJW crowd shutting down free speech crowds and the SJW crowds are almost entirely white, uh, accusing everyone else there of being white supremacist <laughs> and racist. <laughs> I'm not making this up. This is, this is a real thing. You know, uh, before I got into uh, academia and went to university when I was younger, I went to Humber College and I got a diploma in comedy writing because I basically wanted to be like George Carlin. And I also tried writing satire for a while, and I'll tell you, nothing I ever wrote was as ridiculous as what's going on right now. <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> all, all I have to do is get on stage and say common sense things, and hysteria ensues. <laughs> you know, people, people were afraid to come to the event tonight. They were saying it's a terrifying thing, filled with hate. I, I don't know what these people are talking about. I feel like kind of a badass because people are offering to like get me bodyguards to come here. And I'm not all I ever, I just say simple thing. You know, men and women are inherently different. Is that like? So, um, so actually yesterday there was a recent Globe and Mail article written by a PhD of sexual neuroscience that supports this event, so she actually does support the Canadian Freedom Summit, and claims that several of her colleagues have expressed significant pressure to keep their mouths shut on politically charged topics. So actually even within sexual neuroscience, many of her colleagues uh, would not want to study gender dysphoria or things along those lines because they're afraid if their findings are anything against um, what, let's say, societal mainstream would want it to be, that they'll eventually be shoved out of their careers. So I guess my question would be, um, and I think I already answered it, but I would like to hear your take. Do you believe that there's a culture pervading campuses that is working to suppress free speech? And if so, what are one or two correctives to, to this trend? And maybe Josephine, we'll start with you. 
I don't necessarily think there's a culture, I mean, especially in like the STEM fields and science technology, I feel like a lot of, um, there's not that many censoring going on there. Um, but then when you look at the humanities and you look at sociology and you look at um, feminist and gender studies is where you see kind of more, how about this? Okay, if you were to write an essay on um, the Israel and Palestine conflict and you were to go to the political science uh, journal, um, you'll be able to find sources that are in favor of Israel and sources that are in favor of Palestine and sources that are in between. So this allows you to draw your own personal conclusion. This allows you to use the um, literature that's available to draw your own conclusion. But the issue with um, programs or studies like gender studies and feminism is the conclusion. They already have um, they've already made their own conclusions. They've already said that the patriarchy is real. They've already said that racism is worse today than it's ever been before. So it's difficult for you to kind of draw your own conclusion. And for example, my sister, she had to write an essay, or she took a sociology course and wanted to write an essay on the wage gap and her professor completely shut it down and said, you are completely false, um, your premise is false, the patriarchy is real, and not to, to only use feminist sources. And on top of that, the sources that she's not allowed to use in this paper is Statistics Canada, the Government of Ontario <laughs> website, the Government of Canada website, the Encyclopedia, and Dictionary.com. Those are the list of sources that's not, that's not allowed in this assignment. So of course, because of that, she would, her conclusion would have to be the same as what the textbooks say, which is in fact that the wage gap is real. Um, so I feel like there's more of a culture in those um, fields of studies, but I don't see it much in the STEM. And those are the same students that start to take over the student union and then start to fight for social justice because they were taught in class that the patriarchy is real and it's ready to take over. But yeah, that would be my answer. Okay. <laughs> All right, so Amanda, as a physics major, um, is STEM completely devoid of any cultural suppression of freedom of expression? Well, I think, I don't think it's just STEM. I think there's absolutely a culture across all fields. Um, looking at, you know, campuses alone, York, I think it was, I don't know how long it went on for in 2008, flat out banned any pro-life speech. U Alberta was hit with a $17,000 security fee. U, you know, University of Guelph has been hit with similar, and the JCCF has been fantastic with helping with that. Um, but, you know, it, I think more importantly than talking, well, not more importantly, but equally importantly to talking about the current situation is what we can do in the future. You know, and, and we're going to have to be twice as careful and be judged twice as strongly, but that doesn't matter. We can't resort to victimhood of a different strain. So I think going forward, you know, if you're not already, do not resort to their level it's very easy to see someone on a different side engaging in this kind of censorship, whether it's at a Milo speech or, you know, Ben Shapiro who's here tonight. Don't resort to the labels. Don't resort to the personal attacks. Don't try and censor other people because, you know, oh, they did it too. Read things you disagree with. Openly talk and listen to people more left-wing than you. Yes, there's a lot of social justice warriors who are past helping, but there's also a large faction of people, it's true, it's true, there's also a large faction of people who, you know, aren't that into politics, all they watch is CNN, CBC every night, and at this point it's almost understandable the ignorance they have to the situation when that is what media is portraying, so talk to those people, don't alienate them, they are who we need to get on our side and show the truth to if we want to win this, and we can't have an us versus them attitude as the people who we don't agree with do. So, you know, don't resort to their level and let's just keep our heads low and keep being rational and pragmatic. And I think that's the best solution. So actually, just because we're a little short on time, I want to change gears, and I'm going to ask you a specific question, Alex. So you're the founder of uh, Freebird Media. You're, um, you're into preserving and promoting free speech. And so as the founder of Freebird Media, what role should campus journalism, such as U of T's Varsity, uh, Ryerson student newspaper, York student newspapers, what role should they play in promoting free speech, free expression, in trying to um, you know, help keep, keep the culture on campus at least relatively not oppressive? 
The student papers should be promoting free speech. They're, these are universities, and the universities um, were originally founded with the intention of investigating ideas and holding up free speech values and looking for truth. That's the point of university. And so I've noticed that, you know, I have no respect for these university papers like the varsity at U of T and stuff. I, most of what they write is garbage and it's not true. I've been going to these events. I was at the, the Action Summit back in February. I was at most of the Jordan Peterson rallies. I've been at a lot of rallies. The stuff I read the next day in the media, it's not real. Uh, they're smearing people. They're making phantom enemies that don't exist. And I think it's disgusting. Um, the universities, in my opinion, are pretty much cooked. Um, the humanities <laughs> are corrupt. You have a major corruption problem, those of you that are in university right now, and your newspapers aren't helping you. And so what is the point of me? The point in a university setting, they should be promoting free speech. They should be at least trying to be objective when they're reporting on what's happening. I think that's the main thing. Unless they have some other agenda, I don't know about, uh, they should try to be objective because it's not even close right now, at least not at U of T. Um, and that's partly why I've started Freebird Media because we, you know, the answer to this isn't just to start some right-wing company and then act like the equivalent on the right side of the aisle. It's, um, it's, you know, we do need media that's telling the truth first and foremost. And um, Freebird Media I've created as a nonpartisan media platform to give a voice to all kinds of diverse viewpoints because the whole point is to hold these viewpoints up and then criticize them and we'll see which ones are strong and valid and which ones go away. You know, that's what, that's what the original intention was supposed to be and that's what I'm trying to bring back because the mainstream media in Canada is garbage. <laughs> it's garbage. Right. So I, I actually really like one thing that you said in particular. So you were drawing attention to the fact that universities used to be a place where intellectual discourse was encouraged, right? And actually when we look at totalitarian regimes, specifically in 60s Russia, the first people that are trying to purge are academics, right? And the reason for that is because that's where ideas are exchanged freely. So um, for our two students on the panel specifically, um, why do you think institutions such as universities that once used to be bastions of freedom of expression, intellectual discourse, why do you think they're suddenly caving to demands in the last 10 to 15 years? Either, either can go. I think it's because they're afraid, and I mean rightfully so. Um, so one of the main ways universities and colleges make money is through tuition, and the customer is always right. It's always what the students want that the universities and colleges have to do. So if um, the student representatives are saying we want more safe spaces, we want more implicit bias training for all the staff members, then the university would have to do it. I mean, take Evergreen, for example. I'm not sure if you guys saw the Evergreen um, controversy, but people like Brett Weinstein, who is so far left, and now he's being called a racist white supremacist which is ridiculous, but the school is afraid. It, I mean, Brett talked about the accuracy of language and how certain words have the same, um, have different meaning but the same amount of impact. So if someone were to, for example, call me the N-word and someone asked me where I'm from, according to social justice warriors, those are both racist. And according to them, they both get the same penalty. They both get the same reaction. Um, so it's, it's difficult because the schools have to be careful. They have to be careful who they let in. They're afraid that once they get that you know, racist stamp, that sexist stamp, it's very difficult to get that away. And since the, you know, the unions and those people are the ones running the show, they're the ones telling the administration they want more safe spaces, they just have to do it. And you know, money talks. This is how we, they make their money, from tuition. And it sucks, but that's just kind of the state we're in right now. Okay. <laughs> Alright, so money buys safe spaces. Yeah, you know, it's, it's what the other two panelists said. It's a combination of universities in Canada, and there's a little bit of a difference between private and public, but they operate based off tuition, government grants, research funding, and a lot of that comes from papers purchased from libraries, many of which in the humanities never get cited. Um, and it's a combination of that and acquiescing to these children who have learnt and it's not, you know, yes, it's their fault, they need self-responsibility, but what isn't their fault is other universities acquiescing to their temper tantrums. And when you see a group of these kids at one university, whether it's in Ohio and the States or up here, who get to do a sit-in and hold up some, you know, poster board piece of paper with markers on it, making demands, when they get to hold teachers hostage, quite literally, in a room and not letting them leave, when they do these things and they're covered by media 
and they are allowed to do that, well, obviously, they're going to continue. And obviously, if one school is selling to millennials who, you know, react to emotional feelings and buzzwords, if one school starts marketing the university institution as a safe place and a home away from home and, a, you know, a place where we're going to nurture you and make you comfortable, well, people, you know, they vote with their money and they're going to go there. So not to excuse any university behavior whatsoever, it's obviously unacceptable, but I do think it's quite clear to see when there's a lack of accountability on all levels how this just contributes to the problem that we have now. Thank you. Alex, do you have any input? Um, not, not specifically on that question, sorry. Okay, fair enough. So I want to change gears a little bit again. Um, so now I want to touch maybe a more sensitive issue. Is that okay? Any trigger warnings? Anyone? No? Okay. So we're, I want to touch on the, uh, the place of race in the discussion of freedom of expression on campuses. Um, so in all of your opinions, we'll go by one by one, has an oversensitization over or PC-ness when dealing with race work to inhibit freedom of expression on campuses? And um, any of you can start? So Josephine? All right. Might as well. I'm the only colored one here. So. <laughs> hey, I I'm a happy, okay? I'm speaking <laughs> on behalf of all colored people. Um, <laughs> No, but yeah, I, I think it does work to kind of censor people in the sense that, you know, they've came up with a new definition for racism. They've added power to it. In other words, power just means white people. If you're white, you're automatically racist. I'm so sorry. That's just how it is now. Um, but because they've added that, they say white people or white students cannot engage in discourse that has to do with race. They cannot talk about, um, you know, how they feel about a certain situation because it doesn't matter. I'm more impressed. I, you know, my real, I am Muslim, I am black, I am gay, I am this. It's kind of like oppression Olympics. The, mo the person with the most amount of oppression wins and is like the strongest person or the best person. And like Amanda was saying earlier, it's this victim mentality. It's this like, I am sad, I want to be cuddled and told that, you know, it's the white man that's made me this way and not my own doing, which is ridiculous. You're just lazy and they're bored. <laughs> no, it makes me so sad. This is personal to me. <laughs> Seriously, though. No, but like, it, it really sucks, especially when I go to school with these people. I have to see these people every day. And it's like, <laughs> I don't understand how you can just sit there, change something's definition, be a complete, pardon my French, asshole, and then say, oh, well, I'm black, so I can't be racist. No, like, screw that. Then let's just change the word and say you're an asshole instead. We're just going to remove the word racism and call it asshole. Um, <laughs> But it's, it's I, I don't understand it. But yeah, it, it's, it's, it's difficult, most especially for white students. I mean, I can never understand how it feels. I get a free pass on everything. I'm black and a woman. It's great. Um, but I, don't, but I, I feel so bad for the white students in my class when we're talking about, I take political science, and when we're talking about a political issue that ha remotely has to do with race, remotely, everyone just kind of turns to the black students and the white kids kind of take a step back and they're quiet and they're scared. And it's like, no, this is the time that we're all supposed to be having this uh, conversation. In order to move forward as a community, we have to let everyone be involved. And, you know, a lot of, a lot of the black students, especially at University of Toronto, um, just don't understand that. They just want to stick to their victim mentality. But then when they get into the real world, they realize their intersectionality cannot get them a job. So, oh well. <laughs> That's good. So the first time that I met Josephine was last October at a Jordan Peterson uh, support rally that I went to and she started approaching me after the rally and I didn't know who she was and I thought she might be a Black Lives Matter <laughs> member. <laughs> and I remember thinking, I'm like, I don't, I don't know what she's going to say, but I'm not moving, I'm allowed to be here. <laughs> and then uh, it ended up, thank God, being like one of the coolest people I've met this year. But um, race is definitely something that's a big issue on campus and they weaponize it, uh, certain groups against people. And I think in general, like, uh, white people are really friendly and overly nice, and like, uh, especially outside of the city, we're actually the least racist people. And uh, I think that's why white people are usually afraid to like, stand up for themselves in certain contexts when they're dealing with uh, non-white people if they're not used to it, because they, they're so sensitive and afraid of being a racist. And I used to be like that, too. Um, I, went, you know, I, I went to Carleton University, I got an English degree, I graduated five years ago, I've gone through like, this whole postmodernist uh, 
I'm fully indoctrinated. And then, you know, when I got out of Carleton with an English degree, it doesn't do much for you. So I had to, you know, I had to really bust my ass and start working uh, in the in the private sector. You know, I worked in landscaping and I worked uh, at a gym and I worked at restaurants. And every time that I get a, I work somewhere new, I always make friends with my coworkers. And I usually have a black buddy after a couple of months, and we're friends. And then he gets promoted above me because I'm lazy and don't work that hard. And uh, and it just shows me that meritocracy works. And I don't really see this, this white supremacy, uh, white privilege crap really unfolding in the private sector if, you know, when I'm out at work. And then I come and, uh, you know, I, I come to the campuses and I interact with students and I talk to them and all I hear about is this system of systemic racism that's oppressing everyone that I don't see. And um, I think that white people need to stop being afraid of being called racist if you're not actually a racist then you have nothing to apologize for. Just treat people like, uh, you know, individuals and judge them on their merit and it's fine because the cultural Marxism thing, it preys on white people being afraid of being called racist. And if you live a life where, uh, that, and you're not a racist person, then don't be afraid of that label. I'm not afraid of it anymore. People can say whatever they want. Call me a racist. I'm not one. Call me a misogynist. Whatever. It doesn't bother me. And don't let it bother you either because the, the, it's a huge part of, of this problem on campuses. Thank you. Okay, so before I get into what I think the problems are, I do want to say a little statistic first. The Toronto Police Services puts out a report every year on hate crimes in the city. So in 2016, the number one group who were the victims of hate crimes were Jews. Number two, LGBT people. Number three, black people. So you don't have to answer a lot, obviously, but I'd just like to pose a question to you all. If based on our mainstream media coverage, those three would be the groups that you thought were number one. So that said, I think there's a few problems on campuses. I think, first of all, we have a very intentional attempt to conflate race and religion for some motivated purposes there. I think we have some groups getting higher immunity from criticism than other groups. I think we have some groups getting a lower standard of protection than other groups. And I also think that there is, well, I mean, let's put it this way, Black Lives Matter. Um, there's a co-founder of Black Lives Matter, Alexandria Williams, who donated several thousand dollars to her organization. And that's all fine and good, except she was VP of Equity at the time of the York, or sorry, um, of the U of T Student Union, and who are, did, I don't know what the outcome was, sued her. So, when you have a climate on campuses in the first category of receiving higher immunity from criticism, and I'll say the word Islam, when you have people who want to criticize a set of ideas as they are supposed to do in a higher learning academic institution, but there's a very intentional attempt to conflate a religious set of ideas with a race, to give that religious set of ideas personhood rights, and then you have a group of people, Jews, who are not getting the same protection because certain groups want to be anti-Semitic and try and hide it under the guise of criticizing Israel. And there are legitimate criticisms there, that's fine, but that's not what they're doing. And then you have the rest of the population who are being willfully ignorant bystanders to this. And you have groups like Black Lives Matter and Alexandria Williams who you know, going back to the conflating race and, and religion or conflating race and identity when she donates money to her own organization, when she gets criticism, it's very easy for her to say, oh, you're a racist, oh, you're this, you're criticizing my race and not my actions as an individual because postmodernism, your identity and your beliefs are one, how convenient. You get this climate that, again, continues to foster this environment. This is their game. This is very intentional. They made these rules. Debate and logic and reason is not part of that. So I think, you know, in, in terms of solutions, stop apologizing for being Christian. Stop apologizing for being Jewish. Stop apologizing for criticizing ideas. But also recognize that criticizing ideas is very different than demonizing people. And we need to be consistent on that if we want the other side to do the same. So no idea above criticism, no individual below dignity. All right, thank you.
So that will conclude our campus censorship panel. So real quick, just uh, one more round of applause for uh, Josephine. Uh, check out YouTube. My name is Josephine. Uh, Alex Van Ham. Freeburn Media. And Amanda Ellen, liberal, not lefty. My name is Michael Reardon, and now we're going to have Baruch introduce our next speaker.